I raised my chair. Oh, okay. Yeah. That'd be comfortable as pathologist. All right. Yeah. So, okay. So we we all set. Yep. You recording? Yes. Okay. So this is a neuropathology slide review. We're going to uh, review a number of common and less common cases. Not zebras, but things that you should hopefully all kind of have an idea about, especially for board exams. <clears throat> all right. Um, let me skip to this one. All right, so <clears throat> this is a tumor. Uh, typically, you see in a <clears throat> young adult, um, and it's in the ventricle. Oh, okay. All right. So it's in the ventricle, and a lot of the times the surgeon will <clears throat> send this out to try and figure out what he's dealing with. And so do you want me to just say descriptions and or ask questions or uh, I guess? And you can feel free to ask yeah, too. Yeah, ask right. questions too? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, what would the differential be uh, in a situation where there's a tumor in the ventricle in the first place, and irrespective of whether or not you saw something like this? What 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 is the differential for intraventricular tumors? Ependymoma um, to start with. Ependymomas. What what other things? There's at least one other thing that you would want to think of. Well, besides this. <laughs> Neurocytoma. Neurocytoma, and there's one other thing that comes to mind. Uh, Choroid <laughs> plexus papilloma. Yeah. So uh, those, are, those are the main things. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this wouldn't be this type of more. So choroid plexus papilloma would end up being papillary fronds of what look like similar uh, morphology to normal choroid plexus, but it's too many fronds of the choroid plexus. But this is <clears throat> not that. Um, so it's a fairly uniform population of tumor cells. The nuclei look fairly homogeneous. Um, does anybody see any mitotic figures? Probably one or two, I'm not very sure. No, no metallic figures. So, uh, is this an ependymoma? Mm -hmm. Is this what is this? Is this what what were so your cord plexus is out? So, what were the other two choices that you ended up? You said neurocytoma, so. uh -huh. and ependymoma. So, mm -hmm. of those two, um, this is in the ventricle. Right. Um, and uh, typically, it's uh, along the uh, by the septum pellucida or the uh, fornix, and it, it kind of looks like um, if it were in the brain at the periphery, it might look like um, an oligodendroglioma. You could certainly confuse. It kind of has maybe some blood vessels with. Um, some fibrillary processes around them. Um, so, I mean, that might be a blood vessel. Um, so, a pneumoma, that's the scope on this power is not so great. Yeah, it um, is something wrong with it. Yeah, it's probably somebody got oil on it. Um, so, this is a neurocytoma. Um, and 
the, the main difference between uh, neurocytoma and ependymoma is its location. Most, although you can't always tell. If you have a huge tumor in the ventricle, then it could be an ependymoma, it could be um, a neurocytoma. But typically, uh, uh, an ependymoma, you have uh, anywhere that there's fibrillary processes, you typically end up having a blood vessel in the center of a fibrillary zone with its acellular and around that fibrillary zone um, are uniform cells. So um, they can look very similar. Um, sometimes an ependymoma will have true ependymal rosettes uh, where they have an actual lumen and uh, microvilli lining the lumen um, trying to recapitulate uh, an actual ependymal lining. Um, but this is actually a neurocytoma. And <clears throat> what's the grade for a neurocytoma? Anybody else? So it, does it have an increased risk for recurrence? Neurocytoma? Neurocytoma. Oh, yes. Hmm? Yes. Well, normally if you resect re it, um, it doesn't recur. So okay. I believe it's a grade one, actually. Look it up. Do you have a book in there? <laughs> I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, I think for the most part, uh, they have a very low risk of recurrence. Um, look up real quick, because I don't want to say that it's a, I think it's a one, but they have a low risk of recurrence. Uh, occasionally, um, when they're removed, uh, they can have mitotic figures if you go back. Um, uh, if they do a bi biopsy and don't remove the whole thing, or they do a staged resection, when they go back again, there might be a little bit of necrosis, there might be some mitotic figures from reactive changes from the original resection if it was a short period of time prior. So you always have to have the clinical story to find out whether or not it was um, just recently resected or not, because it can alter the uh, histologic appearance and make it look like it might be a higher grade and have some atypical features. Most of the time, there are no mitotic figures. Uh, oh, it is a grade two. Yeah. OK, yes. not a grade one. But usually, they do not They do really, really well. So they can be huge, though. So you were right, grade two. I forgot. We don't see them all that often, but um, they're a very interesting tumor. OK. so. Now we've got another tumor. Um, so the immunoids, we, we, we have to do synaptophysin. Synaptophysin is helpful. Um, they're typically GFAP negative, mm -hmm. um, but synaptophysin is very low MIV-1, so it's usually like 1 or 2%. If you see any mitotic figures, it's a concerning uh, prognosis or concern for <coughs> increased uh, risk for recurrence but it's very uncommon for it to have a lot of mitosis. Um, the only time I've seen a lot of mitosis or to have necrosis is when there was a previous resection of the tumor um, a few weeks previously and they went back and did a second resection for more of the bulky tumor. They had a two-staged approach because it was so massive. Um, these typically are in young uh, adults or um, kids, So, but you have to at least think about it. Okay, so this is the next tumor. Um, just sign up. Yeah. Is that yours? Yeah, it's mine. Okay, sorry. So now we've got brain, and there's an uh, abnormal infiltrate, and there's calcifications. So there's some calcifications mm -hmm. here. There's. Some blood vessels here, some thin capillary blood vessels here, and calcifications. This is not microcystic change. This is just calcifications that have fragmented the tissue. Um, and we drive around, and if we look at these on a little bit higher power, <clears throat> the nuclei are a fairly uniform population of cells, fairly uniform nuclei. Uh, not seeing mitotic figures, and there's almost a suggestion of a paranuclear halo. Mm -hmm. uh, some more uh, capillaries here, capillary network. Um, there's cortex here. Uh, this is the peel surface. 
Um, so we have cortex underneath the peel surface, and there's actually a population of tumor cells at the peel surface. So there's sub-peel extension of the tumor at the peel surface. Uh, and you go deeper, the tumor is... Looks like it's it's infiltrating into the cortex. There is focal necrosis. This is all necrotic. There's no nuclei in the cells that are present here. Um, okay, so what do you think this is? Looks like an oligodendron. Yes, so this is an oligodendroglioma. Mm -hmm. Now, most oligodendrogliomas uh, typically are uh, peripherally located. They uh, tend to, they are infiltrative, so they typically are going to, you're going to see neurons in the cortex, and uh, within the cortex, you'll all see, also see tumor cells infiltrating into that cortex. <coughs> So I'm not sure if it's fragmented, so it's a little hard to demonstrate on this one. But um, typically you end up having uh, neurons that are surrounded by tumor cells. Uh, and oligodendrogliomas typically love the uh, white matter and cortex. They tend to uh, be almost... Um, they love cortex, they expand the cortex. So radiographically, low-grade oligodendrogliomas tend to end up having a uniform population of cells that infiltrate into the cortex, and then they spill into the white matter as well. Um, but they love cortex, so they're typically in the cortex. If they're in the white matter, they're also in the cortex. They tend to have microcalcifications. They can have a cystic, microcystic change. Uh, and the difference between a low grade, grade two versus a grade three uh, is going to be whether or not they're mitotic figures um, or if there's necrosis or vascular hyperplasia. Now, there's been recently some changes in oligodendrogliomas and glial tumors in general as far as their grading and diagnosis. So, with an oligodendroglioma, uh, 1P19Q, is it necessary to have 1P19Q uh, co-deletion for a diagnosis of an oligodendroglioma? Yes. Yes, that's true. So now uh, it, the diagnosis of an oligodendroglioma requires a diagnosis by having 1P19Q co-deletion. What about uh, IDH1? So IDH1 is now uh, a marker for low-grade versus high-grade tumors. So um, would you want to get an IDH mutation? Uh, the IDH1 R132H is an antibody that you can use to stain uh, astrocytic tumors, oligodendrogliomas, uh, diffuse uh, astrocytomas. So how would this, how would you expect this to mark? Um, with an IDH1 R132 antibody. Do you have any idea? Is it positive is low grade? Hmm? Is it positive is low grade? Uh, well, it can, but so if you have um, an oligodendroglioma, whether it's a high grade or a low grade, uh, and it's uh, 1P19Q cotyledon, um, most of the time, the vast majority of time, your um, IDH1 R132H antibody is going to stain for the um, tumor. It's going to stain the tumor. So reactive staining of tumor cells by IDH1 R132H is indicative of a tumor that has a good prognosis. Uh, and so the tumors that stain with IDH1, R132H, are oligodendrogliomas that are 1P19Q cotyledon as well as uh, diffuse astrocytomas low grade. Now, an oligodendroglioma can transform to an anaplastic oligodendroglioma, but it still has 1P19Q cotyledon and it still is going to be um, IDH mutant. Now, Say you've got what looks like an oligodendroglioma, 
and it doesn't stain with IDH1 R132. Does that mean that it's doesn't have an IDH mutation? No. It means that you need to do next-gen sequencing to determine whether or not there's an IDH mutation, another IDH mutation besides the IDH1 R132H. IDH1 R132H is present uh, in about 85% of low-grade gliomas, uh, but not all of them. And so there's a percentage of tumors that have uh, IDH1 mutations that are different than the R132H, um, a different translocation, or uh, their IDH2 mutations. IDH2 uh, mutations are not very common, but they do occur. Um, so there, if you get a tumor that looks like a low grade, you think it's an infiltrating glioma, uh, and you think it's either an oligodendroglioma or you think it's a, a diffuse astrocytoma, you have to now put uh, determine whether or not there's an IDH mutation. Um, and uh, if you can't do that stain, then you have to say oligodendroglioma not otherwise specified to indicate that the IDH mutational analysis is not done. Or you, uh, if you don't have the uh, fish for 1P19Q cotyledonous. If you have fish and it's 1P19Q cotyledon, it's, it's going to be an oligo. It's always good to confirm that it does have the IDH mutation uh, for prognostic purposes. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. So now we have another tumor. And so this tumor, there's a bunch of, there's clusters of tumor cells and hyalinized blood vessels in the background. So I'm gonna drive around. Lots and lots and lots of blood vessels. Where is it located? Uh, it is in the dura. In, in, in. Mm. Meningioma. Mm -hmm. So what? I mean, any meningioma that's a low-grade meningioma, you can call it a meningioma straight up and not subclassify it as anything. So there are some on bodies. Um, part of the reason why you want to end up subclassifying mm -hmm. some meningiomas, <clears throat> depending on the histologic type, some um, histologic types of meningioma are by definition uh, grade 2 or grade 3. Um, many of the low-grade meningiomas that are subclassified are subclassified because they can be confused with other things. Um, so in this case, we have thick hyalinized blood vessels, um, and that's indicative of a, an angiomatous meningioma. Now, why do I want to bring this up? So the meningioma cells, for the most part in this specimen, are fairly uniform. They do form tumor cell whorls. So that, let me see if I can. So we have tumor cells that are whirling around one another, forming um, small circular clusters. Let me see if I can find a better one. Uh, and there are some somoma bodies, which are not uncommon. Um, so when you see those things, it's very reassuring. Here's a, a, tumor, a small tumor cell whirl right there. Mm -hmm. Um, there's no mitotic figures, or I haven't seen any anyway. Um, the tumor cells are clustered or lobulated, um, and there's these large um, blood vessels, hyalinized blood vessels, all throughout the tumor. There's a, an extensive amount of hyalinized um, blood vessels, numerous blood vessels. So when you get an angiomatous meningioma, one of the things you have to worry about is the nuclei can look very pleomorphic. Um, I'm not seeing any in this uh, case, but uh, you have to realize that just because there's nuclear pleomorphism, that does not change the histologic grade of a meningioma. Nuclear pleomorphism is not an atypical feature. So do you know what atypical features there are? What are the atypical features for meningiomas? 
My mitotic figures, yeah. So how many mitotic figures make it uh, atypical? It's more than four. Four or more mitotic figures is going to be atypical, and how many for, min for malignant? Mm -hmm. No, 20. 20. 20 mitotic figures for malignant. And um, the atypical features are sheeting, um, uh, sheeting, which is a, a, a patternless pattern, uh, prominent nucleoli, um, broad zones of necrosis not related to embolization, um, high cell density, uh, so high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, small cell, um, and high cell, so small cell or high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio and uh, high cell density are essentially the same kind of a, a criteria, but those are both uh, atypical features. So, and then, um, other things, so there's five atypical features, the five that I just described. If you have three of those five atypical features, that makes it an atypical meningioma or grade two. If you have four mitoses or more, that's a separate criteria for an atypical meningioma. Um, if you have cordoid or um, clear cell, by definition, that's going to be an atypical meningioma. Uh, rhabdoid and um, papillary are a grade three, uh, as well as having 20 mitoses or more. So this one is in the brain parenchyma, high cell density. The blood vessels are not normal. So if you look at the blood vessels, this blood vessel has, and oops, sorry about that. Ah, I found it here. So the blood vessels, if you drive around, a lot of the blood vessels have too many endothelial cells or what look like endothelial cells. So in this example, there's at least three cells thick of abnormal endothelial-like cells. Um, so this is vascular proliferation or endothelial proliferation or um, whatever you want to call it. It's an atypical proliferation of vessels Sometimes they can be glomeruloid-like um, proliferation of blood vessels where you have multiple lumina within the um, center of a large blood vessel where it looks almost glomeruloid, like a glomerulus. So those are all endothelial changes uh, that are indicative of, of a high-grade, if it's a glial tumor, a high-grade glial neoplasm. And then if we look at the tumor cells, the tumor cells have uh, an elongate nucleus, elongate irregular. Some of the nuclei are very hyperchromatic. Uh, so this, the hyperchromatic nuclei, irregular, um, those are all indicative of an astrocytic tumor. Here's hyperchromatic, irregular, enlarged nuclei. Uh, this, nu this nucleus has indentations of the nuclear membrane. That's typical of uh, astrocytic neoplasms. And with vascular proliferation and uh, high-grade nuclear uh, changes that are also astrocytic with this elongate, irregular, hyperchromatic nuclei, that goes along with a GBM. So a GBM is going to end up having vascular hyperplasia or va atypical vascular hyperplasia or atypical vascular changes. Uh, as well as astrocytic features. Uh, typically, there's a high proliferation index, although the proliferation index typically doesn't go above about 70%. If it goes above 70%, you may be dealing with um, a tumor that has neuroendocrine uh, or, or um, uh, small cell-like features, uh, or um, so here's a, an atypical mitotic figure. Uh, typically, they're only about 70%. Um, another thing I worry about if, if I see a proliferation index above 70% is are we really dealing with an astrocytic tumor or are we dealing with something else? Uh, lymphomas tend to end up having mitotic figures of uh, or a mid-1 proliferation index of 90% and above. So if it's 90% and above and it looks like it's a fairly uniform population of atypical malignant cells, make sure it's not a lymphoma or, you know, something like that. 
in this case, it looks very glial. The cells are very pleomorphic. They're one to another. They're fairly uh, variable. So this is a, a GBM. Uh, there's probably going to be areas where there's necrosis as well. Let's see. We have pseudopalisating. Yes, yeah, so we have pseudopalisating necrosis as well. So there's central necrosis here, and around the necrosis we have a, uh, a dense network of tumor cells piling up around the areas of necrosis, so pseudopalisating necrosis. So this is even if you got this on a, um, a frozen section, you get pseudopalisating necrosis, you get these elongate hyperchromatic nuclei, that's a, by definition it's, it's going to be a GBM. Most GBMs, if you stain them, IDH1 is going to be, um, if it's a primary GBM, where it's originated as a high-grade tumor from the get-go, in an older adult, typically, usually in the periphery uh, or can be in the brains, in the um, uh, deep locations of the brain, but ones that are primary um, and, and at the periphery in the white matter typically are IDH wild type and ATRX wild type. Um, if they have that phenotype in an older adult at the periphery of the white matter, uh, those are typically GBMs. Um, they typically are very, very densely cellular in the white matter, become necrotic in the white matter, and then infiltrate into the cortex, as opposed to the oligodendrogliomas, which seem to proliferate more in the cortex and then infiltrate into the white matter. Whether or not it actually does it that way, I'm not entirely sure, but um, the, usually in an oligo, you have a lot of it in the cortex, and, and then you can have the same amount uh, in the white matter. But with the GBM, you, you have a lot of cells in the white matter, and then it will infiltrate into the cortex. It can cross the left meninges into the adjacent uh, cortex, but typically it likes the white matter a little bit more than it likes the cortex. So, um, okay, this one. So, Dr. Fox. Yeah. So then uh, the secondary GBMs will have a different phenotype? Yeah, so secondary GBMs uh, start from a low-grade tumor. So typically secondary GBMs are going to end up have, having an IDH mutation. So IDH mutant, meaning that the cells stain with the IDH1 are 132 h uh, And the ATRX is going to be lost. It's going to be mutated. So staining for ATRX is wild type. Mutant ATRX is loss of staining. So your control is always looking at the blood vessels of the tissue to make sure that the blood vessels stain with our ATRX. That's your internal control. If the blood vessels don't stain, uh, <clears throat> then your, your internal control is, is not adequate and you can't say that the tumor cells have lost staining. It could be something um, like INI1 staining, right? INI1 is, is for an atyp atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor, uh, which is a whole different entity. Um, to look for loss of the. Market. Yeah, so it's the yeah. same. Yeah, so it's loss. Okay. But yeah, so in, this, in that same regard. So this is another high grade glial neoplasm. Um, if we, and it's astrocytic, it's obviously not oligodendroglial. There's hyperchromatic, irregular nuclei scattered all over the place. Um, but in this case, there is also, interestingly, sorry. This is a high grade glioma and it's infiltrating into the parenchyma. There's focal brain tissue in the specimen that's probably another piece adjacent to it that's not been infiltrated as much. Um, you can sometimes have mm -hmm. chronic inflammation around blood vessels in high grade gliomas. It doesn't mean that it's not a glioma. You can even have acute inflammation. 
doesn't mean that it's not an infiltrating glioma. Um, I have one that's another good example. So let me go to the next one. So I've got a lot of cases here. Okay. Um, it depends on the institution that you, mm -hmm. if you get a lot of, uh, uh, resections. Oh, no. so this one. Okay. So this is the one that I was thinking of. So here we have a high grade glioma, uh, and we have, what's this? Cartilage. cartilage. So we have cartilage formation. What's this? So bone. So this is mesenchymal differentiation in a high-grade glial neoplasm, high-grade um, um, glioma. So what what would this be then? What would you call this? The gliosarcoma. The yeah. Gliosarcoma. Yeah. So this is a gliosarcoma. Typically, with a gliosarcoma, it's a biphasic tumor. Uh, biphasic tumor meaning that you have two, what look like two histologic populations of tumor cells. One population that's more densely cellular, another population that's less densely cellular, more <coughs> differentiated or kind of more differentiated. And the two populations, one population is reticulin rich and the second population is GFAP positive. So you get a reticulin stain, you get a GFAP stain, it shows the two different populations. You're dealing with a gliosarcoma. Most of the time that reticulin rich network, most gliomas don't have a dense reticulin network, but in gliosarcomas you do. Gliosarcomas have mesenchymal differentiation. Um, uh, they tend not to have epithelial differentiation, um, uh, gland formation. Uh, that tends to be more associated with um, an epithelioid glioblastoma, which has a BRAF mutation, uh, and behave a little bit differently. Um, a, a epithelioid glioblastoma may actually arise from a pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma that has a B, tends to be a, um, present in kids and young adults, uh, and it's thought that maybe the pleomorphic xanthoastrocytomas are transforming into an epithelioid glioblastoma. I don't have an example of that, but this is a nice example of a gliosarcoma. So it, it, it's still a high-grade glioma. It's still a primary GBM. Uh, it's grade four. It has a horrible prognosis, but um, the one thing to realize is that the, despite the fact that it's a biphasic tumor, it's only one um, uh, population of tumor cells. Uh, so phenotyp if you do molecular analysis of these tumor cells, both biphasic populations have the same mutation. So even though it's biphasic histologically, it, um, it's only, it's a, it's a clonal population uh, and it still behaves like a normal GBM. So it still has bad prognosis, okay? Um, so this is, okay, so we have a tumor, it's in, you get it as a brain tumor, you get everything as a brain tumor in frozen section or even, you know, um, at the bench. So you get this tumor, but you look and radiographically it's, it's in the dura, it's at the periphery of the, of the um, brain. And there's a lot of hyalinized blood vessels, and there's some atypical looking cells here. Mm -hmm. that one. And a few more atypical looking cells. Although I'm not seeing prominent nucleoli, but there are typical, so there's maybe prominent nucleolus there. Prominent nucleolus, you want to be able to see at like 10x. Mm -hmm. So you can't really see them. I mean, I can, I can see that one. So there's rare cells that have um, prominent nucleoli. Um, but there's certainly some pleomorphism. And this one looks a little pleomorphic. So what is this? Can it be a PXA? It's in the dura. You talk to the clinician and he says, this is not in the brain parenchyma. In fact, it's always good to talk to the surgeon and always good to find out where exactly is this because you can go down that slippery slope. 
Um, this does not have the typical whorls that you would expect to see. It, this is a meningioma. So what would it say? EMA. EMA. Here's a pseudonuclear inclusion. Um, so meningiomas don't necessarily always look like meningiomas, uh, and they can have some pleomorphism. Now, if they look like a frank malignancy um, with really bizarre looking cells, um, you know, then you have to worry about it being a grade three. But this has no mitotic figures. You do a proliferation index, and it's 1%, uh, 2%. Uh, uh, and it has a few scattered atypical looking cells. Well, these are degenerative atypia in a, an angioma, it's an angioma. So what I showed you before was the classic hyalinized blood vessels, but it, it had the typical meningioma appearance. This is an angioma, it's meningioma, where it has the typical features of an angioma, it's meningioma, where you have degenerative nuclear atypia. Uh, but it still is a grade one and it doesn't behave any worse than any other garden variety grade one meningioma, okay? So knowing that is helpful because you don't want to overcall it. Um, this one I don't know if you guys are going to get. Let me, let me go right to um, Okay, so this So sometimes you get cases of frozen section or permanent sections. Uh, this is from an autopsy. So this is a section of brain stem. This is a section of where are we? So here's the brain stem. And this is the medulla. So here's the alveolar nucleus, the pyramids. Um, and attached at the back of the fourth ventricle, here's choroid plexus, mm -hmm. and attached at the back of the ventricle is this um, heterotopia. And this is a, a subependymal nodule. Mm -hmm. So burn this image into your brain um, because I'm going to now show you a tumor. that looks all the world like what we just saw. Mm -hmm. So you get these tumors and the surgeon sends it to you and this is the pattern. You stain it with GFAP, it's gonna be positive. You stain it with the proliferation uh, marker, MIP1, it's gonna be very, very low. This is a subependymoma. Mm -hmm. Subependymomas are tumors that are slow growing attached to the subependymal region of the ventricles. And just like the one that I showed you from the autopsy, that's what they look like. There's no markers that are going to end up saying, this is a subependymal moment. You have to know the histology and have to know what it looks like to make the diagnosis of a subependymal moment. This is a subependymal moment. <laughs> okay, so just try and recognize, you know, so for what I think of for a subependymal moment, there's these little aggregates of glial cells in a fibrillary background um, and if you look around there's there's these little lobules of glial tissue that have fibrillary and cellular zones and that's typical for a subependymoma okay so this one is just pattern recognition that you need to to know in order to make the diagnosis um, but that's low grade and, um, grade one, they're not going to do anything, so it's, it's good. Okay. Let's do another one. So, this is, um, so this one was a resection 
from the nose in a patient that had uh, um, ketoacidosis, diabetic, really doing poorly. There was a lot of uh, inflammation, granulation tissue. Um, we got bony, bony spicules um, and away from the main tumor mass, we had, again, some bone and some uh, fibrous bone marrow, uh, you know, no, um, no bone marrow elements. It's, it's just kind of a fibrous uh, bone marrow spaces. A little bit of skeletal muscle that's kind of necrotic. Um, and so in a diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, in a patient that has diabetes, one of the things that you want to worry about is whether or not there's an infection. So what kinds of infections does it, would a diabetic get? Mucor. Mucor. So this is a case of mucor. And what was interesting is that mucor typically is not in the area where there's a lot of inflammation. Um, so in this region where you'd expect to see an infection uh, and see organisms, you typically don't see it with mucor. So where was the mucor? The mucor was in the areas where there was, um, oh, that's the, sorry. So if I go to the bony spicules here, so <laughs> see this? Wow. So this is mucor. Um, so mucor is a, a fungal elements that have hyphae, that have branching, and the, uh, they have no septations. Um, so then you get a, a GMS. I like GMS because it really highlights the fungal elements. Um, Somewhere. Huh. Oh, I hit it when I can't find things. Oh, here. No. Found it. Found it. Found it. So the problem is, you know, these sections are very um, thin and they're cutting through some of the elements, but there's no septations in any of these hyphae. So that's a clue that you're dealing with mucor. There's no septations and the hyphae are variably thick and thin. Aspergillus, unless it's degenerating aspergillus, aspergillus is a fairly uniform hyphae. All of the hyphae look exactly identical as far as their thickness and they have septations um uh candida is teeny weeny itty bitty um so this is uh 20x what do we got 40x this is 40x but you can see hyphae at 20x easy you can see hyphae even at 10x no problem candida you're going to be going a 40x to see the pseudo hyphae so Canada is considerably smaller. So knowing what the what they're supposed to look like um, will help you differentiate with what they are. The problem with mucor and aspergillus is they uh, love blood vessels. They include blood vessels, and in the brain, if it gets into the brain, um, aspergillus will send showers. If you have a aspergilloma in the lung, it'll uh, get into the blood vessels and it'll shower into the brain. It plugs the blood vessels and it can cause multifocal hemorrhagic septic emboli of the vessels and little infarcts or big infarcts um, if it's not treated and recognized. Okay, so that's that aspergillus.
Okay. So this is also dural based. And it's fairly nasty looking, right? Very epithelioid. Very epithelioid. It's dural based in an older person. Uh, and it has a dural tail radiographically. So there's prominent nuclei. So even at 10x, you can see there's nuclei or nucleoli at 10x, no problem. And if I have dotted an area where there's mitosis, there's, there's focal necrosis. So, in fact, there's broad zones of necrosis. Uh, the prominent nucleoli, those are atypical features. So then the question is, um, how many mitoses are? And I can tell you there's more than 20 mitoses per 10 hypoid fields. So this is a malignant meningioma. This is what the sheeting, when you say sheeting, so there's patternless pattern of tumor cells. So tumor cells just... It's like you take a strip of epithelium and you take it off your skin and you lay it on a slide. It's a patternless pattern of epithelial, just a sheet of epithelial cells. So meningiomas that have just a sheet of epithelial cells without elobulated or fibrillary processes or, or whorls, um, that's what we're talking about, an atypical patternless pattern. But 20 mitotic figures is going to be malignant, not simply atypical. Um, okay. I'm running out of time. I want to show you a few other good cases. Um, okay. So this is this is a uh, from the spinal cord. Um, where is it? It's near the skin. So this is a skin. Um, this is. I can't remember what part of where the skin was from. Oh, maybe the tongue. This kind of looks like tongue. Um, and underneath it, there's uh, some mucosal glands. And then subjacent to that is this. These proliferative blobs of something. So this here, here. So what is this? Is it We're in the tongue. <coughs> tongue. What's this? Nerve. Nerve. So there's a nerve here. So nerves typically have pointy um, tips to the nuclei. Uh, whereas fibroblasts tend to, to have rounded uh, tips to the nuclei. That's a clue. Uh, you could always get a neurofilament. And a neurofilament, if you got a neurofilament, you would find that this is nerve. Mm -hmm. And the nerve is expanded by this population of shredded carrots. Car shredded carrot like. Um, no, I moved it, sorry. Neurofibroma. So this is a plexiform neurofibroma involving a nerve. Um, and so plexiform neurofibromas have what's described as a shredded carrot-like appearance. I have a, another one. And, and a plexiform expansion, um, the tumor will expand out of the, the nerve, but in a neurofibroma, the, the tumor cells infiltrate within the nerve itself. A schwannoma does not do that. A schwannoma is a peripheral nerve sheath tumor where it's an expansion or proliferation of the sheath of the nerve. And the nerve becomes attenuated, thinned out, and at the periphery. So a neurofibroma causes a fusiform-like expansion of the nerve uh, on a bag of worm, worm-like changes where the entire nerve gets expanded. If you do a neurofilament, you're going to have axons within the nerve itself. 
Uh, whereas with a schwannoma, you'll have, if you do a nerve filament, you're going to have axons at the periphery, and you'll see the nerve, a normal nerve that's really attenuated. So that helps differentiate between the two. Okay. Um. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Did this patient have a neurofibromatosis? That's usually plexiform neurofibromatosis. Is that right? Yeah, I believe this patient did have. This was um, cutaneous. You can have cutaneous. Um, and also, normally when they have NF1, you're going to end up having uh, numerous um, spinal cord uh, neurofibromas, and you can have um, other fibromas as well. Um, so despite the fact that they have a low, the neurofibromas have a low risk for malignant transformation, when you have hundreds of them, the risk goes up. So the biggest concern about a patient that has neurofibromatosis, NF1, is the, is the fact that you have to worry about um, malignant transformation of the tumors. Okay, let me show you another good case. I'll show you a couple of things. Okay, so I just don't have enough time. Um, Too many slides and not enough time. Okay, so this is um, a, this was found in a patient that was, um, that has a small cyst in the brain. And within the cyst, there's a spine, tiny, tiny little dot. Um, so the cyst has a little dot inside the tiny little cyst. Um, neurosistosarcosis. Yes. So this is neurosistosarcosis. This is another one you need to be able to recognize. It's pathognomonic. So this is the larva of cystosarcosis. So in cystosarcosis, you have a thin-walled cyst. Inside that thin-walled cyst is the larva. Uh, this is the, um, the larva, and you have this uh, pink, Eosinoph this very eosinophilic proteinaceous outer layer mm -hmm. and underneath that is a cellular zone and then subjacent to that is a loose matrix uh, and this is I think this is the gut of the larva um, and so you see this and it's pathognomonic the cystocercosis is a dead end organism in humans it's this is um, pig a pig tapeworm so um, the, if you ate the meat from a pig, do you get this? What do you get? You get the tapeworm, yeah. right. So this is from either environmental uh, contaminant of the eggs from the tapeworm. So the proglottids, are the segments of the tapeworm that break off. So you got, you got a cat or a dog, they get cat and dog tapeworms. So you get these little moving proglottid, this ugly looking segment of tapeworm. Inside that proglottid, that proglottid is essentially a great big uterus filled with eggs. And so when it breaks off and goes into the environment, the proglottid breaks down and inside the proglottid are hundreds of eggs. And so that hundreds of eggs get loose into the environment. And if you ingest one of the eggs, the egg goes into the GI tract and it goes through, it, it, it uh, goes to the GI tract wall. Uh, and then the larva goes through the GI tract wall, gets into the bloodstream and can go anywhere. If it goes to the brain, it forms this uh, little larva. In the brain, in humans, it'll degenerate, and the body will resorb this. It'll cause a reactive change. So the, if you can recognize that this is a cystocercosis radiographically, the protocol is not to do surgery. It's just to leave it alone and do anti-seizure medications if a seizure is why it was identified, which is usually the case. Um, but the most important thing is you have to treat everybody including the patient to make sure nobody in the family, no, no relative has a tapeworm. Because if, they ha if the patient has a tapeworm, you can auto-infect yourself. So what happens is if you have a tapeworm, you can cough up these proglottids from the GI tract and then swallow them. 
And by swallowing a proglottid, you have now ingested hundreds of eggs. And those hundreds of eggs can end up um, forming hundreds of these all throughout your body in, every, in all sorts of different locations. So um, in endemic regions where people have tapeworms or have an environment that's got a lot of eggs, uh, you can have hundreds of cystic cirrhosis present within the brain, which can ultimately end up killing you. In the United States, we do get these. I've seen it at least um, uh, seven times. Um, a lot of the times in rural community settings, they recognize it radiographically and don't do surgery. In areas where you have a lot of tumor um, surgery, sometimes they'll mistake this for a tumor. They might do a resection. Um, in this case, the patient had had a cystic cirrhosis removed about um, two years ago, and I got this specimen new. Uh, this is not a degenerated cystic cirrhosis. This looks like it's fairly um, fresh. <laughs> and so then the concern is they're getting more. They had cystic cirrhosis two years ago, which would have been reabsorbed. Uh, now we're, we're getting uh, more uh, larvae that look like they're not degenerated. So they have to check and make sure that they're not being exposed to cystic cirrhosis. Okay. Um, Why uh, the surgery Most of the time it's because they're, well, this one was a huge um, collection of cystic There's there's a specific term for it, and I can't remember what the term is, but there is a specific term where it's in the um, leptomeningeal space and it creates a huge mass. So this was a huge mass causing problems, and the mass was related, related to a bunch of cystocercoses present within that space. So it had to be removed because of mass, actual mass effect. Um, typically, if it was just one cystic cirrhosis, you might not remove this specimen. Um, okay. So this is a tumor that's by the lateral ventricles. Um, kind of looks like our, our um, neurocytoma, mm -hmm. but it's at the wall of the lateral ventricle. If I got a um, CD34 or CD31, what I would find is in all these uh, fibrillary spaces, there are blood vessels. See the blood vessels here? Mm -hmm. um, so this is an ependymoma. Ependymomas are what grade? Grade two, yeah. Except for mixopapillary ependymomas. Mixopapillary ependymomas are where? Yeah. yeah good oh, this is a smear. So, an ependymoma on smear, you have these fibrovascular cores <coughs> with the tumor cells extending out around the fibrovascular cores. And that's a real clue when you do a smear if you have blood vessels with adherent tumor cells surrounding with the fibrillary processes extending out from, from the blood vessel. This is classic for an ependymoma. So on smear, you can do this, and you've got glial cells in the background, glial cells around the blood vessels, but this is typical for uh, an ependymoma, which is why I got it in my set. Um, I want to give you a... okay. So here's a mixopapillary ependymoma. So where, so in this area, it looks like ependymoma. Mm -hmm. um, ependymo mixopapillary ependymomas can look like ependymomas, like garden variety ependymomas, but you can have what's called a tanocytic ependymoma, where it looks like just fibrillary cells. Um, uh, glial cells, they are glial cells, 
Um, and so if you do a biopsy through an area of an ependymoma that's a tanocytic ependymoma that doesn't have this paravascular rosetting, uh, paravascular pseudo rosetting, then you you might be confused with a, an astrocytoma. So um, you want an, in an ependymoma, it's typically by the ventricles, it's typically an expansile mass rather than an infiltrative lesion. Sometimes you can have ependymomas that are super tentorial that are, the, that are out at the periphery as well. Um, but again, they're usually well demarcated expansile masses. Now, if you have a um, mixopapillary ependymoma, you typically have uh, mucinous-like or a kind of um, <coughs> mixoid-like proteinaceous debris uh, in the background of these fibrillary cells that stain with LCM blue. Um, and a mixopapillary ependymoma is where? Spinal cord, lower sacroboxysial region. So it's at the end of the spinal cord, at the <coughs> phylum terminale. So if you have something like this at the phylum terminale, then it's probably going to be a mixopapillary ependymoma. If you have an ependymoma that's anywhere else, then it's a grade two. Mixopapillary ependymoma is a grade one. It's cured if it's resected, but it's in that location, okay? Um, Oh, I gotta show you this. Let's see what's this. Oh, this is a really nice example of a neurofibroma. Um, so this was a cutaneous one. So this is where you get that shredded carrot. This is a really nice example of that shredded like carrot change. So you have uh, uh, pointy nuclei. Um, this this one could be. Oh, and you can you typically have these um, collections of nerve. They're almost like little nerve clusters. Um, if you stain them with neurofilament, they'll be positive. Um, those are typically present as well. This is if you got something on the boards that look like this. Uh, this is a neurofibroma, so it's infiltrating into the tissue. Um, but it is not, it's infiltrating into fat, um, but that does not mean that it's a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. This is still a low grade tumor, um, but this is classic uh, neurofibroma. Okay? Um, This one, this this is dural based. Uh, it was in the tentorium, and I can tell you right now, when we first got this specimen, and it was first resection resected, it was called a meningioma, mm -hmm. but it's EMA negative. Um, and so on the second resection, I got it when I first got it here. Uh, I was like, well, this is not quite typical for a meningioma, and it's a little funny. Uh, it's not forming whorls. It could be a fibrillary meningioma, but it was EMA negative. So uh, I ordered a few additional stains. Uh, I got an S100, and it was diffusely positive. This is dural-based. Uh, there are a few mitotic figures. Um, this was the sec I think this was the third resection. Uh, on the second resection, there were no um, mitotic figures, and the time interval from the second resection to the third resection was about 10 years. Um, and this was positive for HMB45 and melan A. Wow. This is a melanocytoma. It started out being a melanocytoma. In the, <coughs> this resection, it's a melanocytoma with atypical features. And it's concerning for transformation into a melanoma. So you have melanocytes that are all over the brain. Um, melanocytomas typically arise in the area of the tentorium, uh, the dura. And um, you just have to recognize that it's not a meningioma. It's usually a uniform population of melanocytes, no mitotic figures, low, 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 low proliferation index. 
Um, they can end up um, being completely benign and, and they, can re they can recur. They can transform to, a mel to an actual melanoma. You can have um, a mel um, a, a melanoma that's widely distributed over the entire leptomeninges as melanoma. Uh, and you can also have melanoma arising in a melanocytoma or melanoma as a nodule. Melanoma can look like anything, but melanocytoma is something that you do need to remember about. Most, however, are pigmented, like, mel like normal melanocytes in, in other parts of the brain um, or uh, melanomas anywhere. Most are pigmented. This one was a, a relatively apigmented. Um, when I distributed this to our regional neuropathology group, uh, one of the neuropathologists said that they had cells that had pigment. <laughs> but that's it. Nobody else had it. I, we had multiple sections from multiple resections that were completely amelanotic. So most are melanotic, um, but there are some that are amelanotic. It's something to just remember. And there's one more tumor I want to show you because um, you'll get it. Couple. Should we? Well, do we have time? Done. Or are we done? We could do more another time. Have yeah, to we do can another do session. Another we'll do another day. session because we're already over. Yeah, sure. Uh, I got a lot, of, a lot of cases. So. Thank you. No, it could be good to have a good session Maybe, again. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I made the wrong. I can't believe I started the session by giving the wrong grade. Oh my god. You guys are never gonna want me over here. Thank <laughs> 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 <laughs>